and that will change some of the things that I intended to say into something different. It uh, released me from having to say some, which gives me some more time on others, uh, and that's okay. Sometimes being up here is the process of adjusting to who's sitting in the room or what someone has said, and uh, that's good. I will give you a little bit of background. I intend to be very candid this morning and tell you pretty much beforehand what I'm going to talk about so that you can be looking at it to see if the texts support what I'm putting forth. Who are the sheep? We're going to look at, eventually in this, the uh, parable that Jesus gave of the ninety and nine. Why are we going to look at it? I have heard it used several times over the past few years in a way that I did not think was correct. And Shirley made a very good point this morning that some parables, even though they may bump right up against some topics, don't talk about those topics. And we have to be able to discern the parable to see what it's saying, what it's not saying, what the topic is, what the intended message is, and not try to push it beyond that point. So with that we start on. Who are the sheep? Things to consider. And I intend to answer four out of five of these questions before we move away from this page. Now, I'm not going to give you complete, exhaustive answers, nor do I intend to discuss what we're discussing today in an exhaustive manner. So if you think, well, why didn't he bring up this text? It's because we don't have enough hours. Okay. Who is the shepherd? For what we're intending to think of today, it's Jesus. However, that said, the 23rd Psalm, which I would hope most people know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's not Jesus. And most of the Trinitarian world will quote that as if it's Jesus. It's not. That was the God of Israel, Yahweh, that was David's shepherd. But, as you're going to see in the text that we look at today, God gave a lot of things to Jesus. He handed him authority, power, words, and people. And Jesus says, those who my Father gave me. You can read that in the 17th chapter of John. We're going to read a lot of things from John today. Who is the shepherd? In this instance, it's Jesus. What are the attributes of sheep? Well, I want you to look at the text as I read them today and see if this isn't correct what I'm saying. The attributes are sheep of sheep are first humility, a childlike humility. Second, that they recognize the voice of Jesus and third, that they follow Jesus, that voice, without departing. That could be a fourth thing, but it's something that has to be added. That the sheep know his voice, they follow, and they don't know anyone else's voice. Okay. Are there other allegorical animals? in the Bible. So we can list a bunch of them before we leave this page. We know there's goats. We know there's wolves. There are serpents. There are doves. There are foxes. And there's at least one lion out there that we have to be aware of, that it speaks of allegorically. Also refers to that one as a serpent. So we have to be careful enough when we're reading to distinguish a being between the lion who has serpent-like qualities and the doves who have serpent-like qualities. One up there. These are all One things outside. we have to be able to sort out. What are the attributes of these other animals? A lack of humility, which would be pride. 
a refusal to hear the words of the shepherd, a refusal to answer the call of the shepherd, or a refusal to stay with the shepherd. And the question I said I'm not going to answer, what are we? You're going to have to answer that one. I can't do it. And that was an excellent point that was brought out this morning. We may not be able to distinguish between wheat and tares. We may be growing up right amongst them. Wheat or tares. I say that wheat and tares because what are we? Are we a wheat or are we a tare? Are we, are we automatically a wheat because we're sitting in this room? Does that make us a wheat? At the moment, we might look like one. But do we leave here and continue to behave that way? So we're going to start right out where, this com where we get a lot of information. The 10th chapter of Jesus, or 10th chapter of John, excuse me, is where Jesus is explaining this relationship of shepherd and sheep. Interestingly well, well, enough, he doesn't really say much about him being a shepherd. He just refers to the fact that he's the one that calls people. He's the door. He's the access point. And he's the one that the Father has chosen to work through. So let's see what we see here. John 10.4 And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. So I'm, I want to remind you, what we're trying to do is get a list of attributes of sheep here. Because we can't really go through the parable until we know what it is that we're looking for. What category of people. So we see here that they hear his voice, they know his voice, they follow, they don't follow strangers, they don't even know the voice of the stranger. Okay. Down further in the text, another bit of important information. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Then Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. Right? The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Yeah. Jesus gave a lot of signs of his origin. That these people should have known who he was based on what he did. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. So the sheep were not Israel. And I'm going to Refer to some texts this morning that I'm not going to read to you for the sake of time and so that you're forced to look it up for yourself. But the Apostle Paul said, they're not Israel, or not all of the people that thinks they're Israel are Israel. Okay, A true Israelite is one who is circumcised in their heart, not just in the flesh. Jesus says, of those Jews, at that time, you are not of my sheep. So we can't make the mistake of thinking that the sheep, general category, was the house of Israel. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. Ah, so you really can't say that someone is a sheep I mean, you and me, we really can't determine that someone is a true sheep until Jesus has given them eternal life, which fits very well with what we read in Matthew 13, doesn't it, about the, the wheat and the tares. 
it doesn't become completely apparent who is which until the harvest. Then you can say, okay, now we know what they are. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Another cat, another uh, demonstration of what the sheep are. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my father's hand, or out of my hand, excuse me. God gave them to the Son, to Jesus, and Jesus will keep those ones by the power of his word, by the power of the sheep hearing the voice, answering the voice. Okay? Let's move on. I'm backing up now in the text. This is in between the two sections that we just read. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So there's three things that need definition here, working it backwards. One shepherd. We've already talked about that. Jesus, in this context, is that shepherd. The shepherd who really is answering to the one who owns all the flock. And if you don't think that's true, then you read Peter's letters. We are going to read some of that in a little bit this morning, Lord willing. But Peter referred to them all as the flock of God. He owns the flock. He's put Jesus in charge as shepherd. One flock. But there's more than one fold. You see that? One flock, but more than one fold. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. There he's referring to other people who would hear the voice of Jesus and say, that's the shepherd. That would know his voice and follow him. But they were not of this fold. They were not of the house of Israel. They were sheep from a different source, but they were all going to be pooled into one flock. Just another part that needs to be kept separate. Matthew 10, 5-6. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hmm. Well, we're going to hold some of our thoughts on this, but I do want you to see that when it started, he sent the twelve out. He says, you don't go to the Gentiles now. You don't enter the city of the Samaritans yet. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Later on, he says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bags for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy. Now, I have that in red because I want you to think about something. We cannot distinguish with any degree of certainty who is going to receive eternal life. We think we see people and we think this is a good person, right? This, is, this person speaks good words. They sound like they understand the words of Christ. But until someone dies, it's very difficult for us to say they lived their entire life as a good person until they've lived their entire life. And we may not even be witness to that, to one person's whole life. We're only witness to what we see when we're in their presence. We don't see what they're doing when they're not around us. 
There's a lot of things we don't know. But there is a degree in to which we can see if someone is behaving well. Now, we can't say, well, they're well, they're behaving well right now, so thus they will receive eternal life. But what we can see is if they're not behaving well, that something has to change. That there will, no, will be no eternal life if there's no good behavior present. So he tells them, when you go into a town, you inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And we're going to read a little bit more about that in some other texts. But what I want you to see here is that those who were sent to instruct people in the Word of God, he first said, you go to this very select group of people. And you have to determine whether those people are worthy of this message. Well, aren't all people worthy of it? Well, that's what we kind of like to think, right? But we're going to read some other words here that tell us that there has to be some distinguishing done. Matthew 10, 14 through 16. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words. So that's a defining point right there, right? If they don't receive you, that's one thing. If they just say, I don't even want you to come in my house. Or, or ignore, hear your words. When you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Now, some people I've heard say, well, this was during the time still under the law age, and so they were treating these people in Israel this way because they were fellow Israelites. I'm not going to tell you where. I'm going to suggest you find it because in the book of Acts, this happens as well among cities well outside of the nation of Israel where Paul and the people with him shook the dust off their feet and shook the dust off their clothes at the city and said, we're moving on. Verse 15, Surely I, or assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Okay, so now we see Jesus referring to the house of Israel because before he said, you're going to the house of Israel, not to the Gentiles, not to the Samaritans, to these cities. So now he refers to the whole house of Israel as a group of including sheep and wolves. Okay? Therefore be wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. So we bring in two other animals that were expected to understand the attributes of those two. And he tells us what it is. Wisdom and harmlessness. Refers to the serpents for the wisdom part. You have to be smart. Yeah. Why would they have to be smart? If there was no stipulation that you had to be able to read people at all, what would there have any application of wisdom? But if people were possibly going to treat you harmfully, how important is it that you're told that you can't return harm? So by this we understand that when he said, let your peace go out to them, but if they don't hear you, let your peace come back to you, that he's not saying, take your sword after them. But we have to think about it. What does it mean? 
Was it a peaceful situation when Jesus was brought before the rulers and he shut his mouth and didn't say anything? How did his peace return to him? Matthew 25, 31 through 34. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. I just want us to see the Son of Man is the one who's going to sit on the throne. He's the one that's going to do the gathering and the judging here. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then further down the text, he said he refers to those on the left. He will say also to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There's a lot more information that we could gather from that that defines what a good or a bad person is based on how they treated Jesus' brethren. He said that that's the same as treating me. But we don't have time for all of that this morning. That's not the point. In Matthew 7, 15 through 17, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. I'm hesitating there because I think we need to note that there can be deception. And there will be deception. There will be trickery through putting on certain clothing. And would that represent behavior? or speech, saying words that sound like they might be following the shepherd, but they're really there to deceive so they can eat up or tear up the sheep. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. But here's the difficulty in that. It doesn't bear fruit till it's developed. Right? You can't really tell until you see the fruit. And sometimes that takes time for that to be evident. Over the last couple months, we've had several discussions, several lessons here on what we do about people in the church who want to walk away or want to go back to behavior that they had before they came into the church. And that falls under the category of restoration. Now, we have the texts that tell us that we need to separate ourselves from some people, that we can't associate on the same level with those people. And I'm not here today to talk about how we sort that out. This, this is really a different thing than we're talking, that we're talking about here. Being able to sort out who the sheep are, and being able to understand the parables that use those words. How do we sort that out? But we do have to understand here that sheep's clothing, when we put on something as a cover to fool someone into thinking that we're something that we're not, when inwardly, We're an animal that's ready to tear, to do harm, not good. Mike mentioned this text this morning, but we didn't look at it. We're going to look at it today here. Acts 20, 
and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just so you have the background, Paul had already determined that he was going to get to Jerusalem as quickly as he could because he wanted to be there at the time of Pentecost. And so he had elected to not go to some of the towns that he had been in in the past on his trek back to Jerusalem. And one of the cities that he decided not to go to was the city of Ephesus. But as he sailed past the southwest corner of what's today Turkey, Asia Minor, he stopped at a town on the coast and sent messages to the city of Ephesus saying, please have the elders come down. I want to talk to them. So they did. The elders from the city of Ephesus came to him. And this is part of the discussion he had with them. And he, before this, says, you need to remember that for three years I was with you and I told you night and day with tears that things were not going to keep going well. And in that he says this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which... Why did I put that in, in another color? Because I wanted us to note that Jesus is the true shepherd. But there has been some responsibility given to some who are among the flock. Not outside or over above, but among the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made overseers, or looker out overs, to watch over, protect, make sure they're fed, make sure that something doesn't creep in to destroy them, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And remember some of the last words that Jesus spoke to Peter, according to John, were, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I said I did. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Peter goes, oh, geez. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Yeah. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. By that, we know a couple things. That Jesus expected Peter to keep teaching the people what he had heard from Jesus. The same words. And to care for them like Jesus had cared for them. And he wanted to make it abundantly clear that that was his job. Right. The church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Verse 30 or 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, so this would be another category. Also from among yourselves, the elders at Ephesus. Men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And of course, we're here really to just build this background for understanding the parable of the ninety and nine and how we, how we would use that correctly. So, all the flock, not just some of one fold, or some from another fold, but all the flock, because in Ephesus we had a combination of Jews and Gentiles. Okay? 
with full understanding that there are savage wolves. That there were people that would come in with the idea of tearing up the flock, breaking up the flock. But also that from among themselves, there would be those that could speak perverse things and draw away disciples after themselves. All of those categories are very real. Luke 10, verses 1 through 3. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where, and I should have put this in another color, where he himself was about to go. So he sent these people out as an opening act, kind of like John, sent out as an opening act to soften up the crowd, to figure out which ones were worthy All right. Question, how do you remember? Book of Mark, the very first words we have that were the words of Jesus recorded in Mark, he makes a statement, then he makes three commandments. Remember what they were, the first three commandments? He starts off with this, the time is at hand, right? Or the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. Follow me. The first three things that he said. Repent. There's the humility. Believe the gospel. There's hearing his voice. Follow me. That's pre proper behavior of a sheep to the shepherd. Okay, That's the very first things we see. Verse 2 here, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold I send you out as lambs among wolves. We've already talked about that. I just wanted you to see this, this other context in which he said it. We talked about it before with the 12 when he sent them out. Now he's sending out the 70 with the same warning that you're lambs in the middle of a bunch of wolves. So I hope we would understand that he's not looking at all of Israel as his sheep. He clearly said to those who were questioning him, you're not my sheep. You won't hear my voice. 2 Peter 2, 20-22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, now, this he's talking to the church, so he says this, but he's talking about people who out, throughout time, throughout the history of Israel, had either been in the process of trying to tear apart that flock, or were just rebellious and would not do what God had told them to do. And he says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So here's two more animal types the dog, and the hog. And they're the returners. The ones who turn around after they had turned around, they turn back around again and walk away. Do you remember, and I, like I said, I'm not going to read every text for you, but I want you to remember 
What did James say in the fourth chapter about humility, God, and whether we move towards Him or we move away from Him? Right? Humble yourselves in the sight of God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God or draw close to God and he'll draw close to you. This is all, this is all related. Now, does that mean that we write off someone who has walked away? No, it doesn't mean that. We have plenty of texts that tell us that Restoring someone like that is a good thing if they're restorable, if it can be done. But we have to understand what category they place themselves in. In the moment that they are not behaving well, what animal category are they? If they've heard the commandments of God and they turn away from them, this is not me saying this. This is what Peter is saying. Based on what Jesus said. The one who Jesus said, feed my sheep, is saying that if you don't follow the commandments of Jesus, if you don't stay with them, you become a dog. You become a pig. If you harm the church, you become... A wolf. So we have to be able to sort these things out. Now we get to the text in question. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. And I want you to note what he's talking to or about here in this text. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become... We catch that? Unless you are converted and become... As little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's the context in which he's going to speak. Okay, that, This is where he's going to speak the allegory or the parable. A parable is just another form of an allegory. An allegory is the over all umbrella over this type of language. A parable is one type. An allegory is just when you have a narrative that has a symbolic meaning that does not become readily apparent in the narrative. That's an allegory. A narrative with a symbolic aspect that is not readily apparent in the allegory, you have to think about to make a point. Okay? But here, the context is they wanted to know who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he calls a little kid over and says, okay, unless you become converted and become like this child, there's no way you're getting into the kingdom. Whoever humbles himself as a little child, that's the one who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now we go on reading. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Let me speak plainly. All of us were that which was lost. All of us fit into that category of being that which was lost before we truly accept the grace of God. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? 
And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So we have to bring in all that we've heard about sheep and what he was sending his disciples out and his role, what he was going out to find. He was going to find those people of the nation of Israel who were willing to humble themselves willing to repent, willing to hear. And he knew that there were a whole bunch of them, even though they had grown up in the nation of Israel, had never been, because of the elitism of the leadership, who looked at the main people and said, ah, they're just a bunch of ignorant people. You don't think this is true. Read John again and see what the Jews said to those people. See what they said to the man that Jesus healed and then met up with again later in the temple. They said, you're unlearned, you're a sinner because you're unlearned. You can't learn, you don't have learning, you don't have schooling. Only we are the ones. Those people who lived in that country Remember, they didn't have all the books and things that we have today. Jesus sent out to find those people who were, all of them, needing to be found. This is not talking about the ones who have heard and strayed, but he's talking about all those people out there in the world who have a good attitude, who are willing to hear that he is willing to leave the ones who have heard to go out and find them. And that is the role of the church as well. That we have to be constantly looking for those who are willing to hear these things. Luke records the same parable in a slightly different context, and yet it's the same. Luke 15, 1 through 7. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So, or therefore, because of this, he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoices, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Now I'm not saying that there is no way in this context to understand this to mean that sheep can stray after they've become sheep. But I'm saying that what the context is, is that he's looking for people as we should be looking for people who are willing to change their lives the first time. That we're looking for new converts, new people with a heart willing to humble themselves. And one last bit of evidence on this. 1 Peter 2, 25. And once again, he's talking here to the whole church, and he says, For you, church, were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. He was not referring to, church, to the church as being all of you who used to believe and then you decided you didn't believe anymore, or then you decided you wanted to go back to your old practices. No, he's talking about 
that all of us were in a lost state until we heard the gospel and accepted it. And at that point, we're found sheep. If we have the right attitude, if we follow those words, and if we're not pulled away by another. Let's close with a song. Stand and song, sing song number 23, Save Her Like a Shepherd Lead Us, 23. shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day that we could praise you, that we could learn from your words. We pray that you will strengthen us in our ability to retain these things and use them properly. We ask that you will forgive us when we fail you. We pray for all of your people that are scattered abroad, that you will guide and protect and comfort and heal as fits with your purpose and with your love. We ask that when you send Jesus back, and we do pray that that day would be soon, 
that we would be found worthy to have a place in your kingdom and to enjoy this earth for eternity with you and your son. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.